Walk him down, walk him down, so gotta fit away, jump up, Perfect. You know what I mean? It's just about keeping your composure. You know his game to death. Walk up, three point in the air for Gianna. Three for the money. Oh, look, Gianna can jump up. Gianna, no jump up. And welcome back. Ladies and gentlemen, Story Reporting Live 101 Series. Thank you for tuning in once again. Thank you for uh, watching our last episode featuring Cheat Code. And um, like I said in the last episode, and the last episode, and the last episode, every one of my guests are special. And today we have a very esteemed guest. I believe he was my first interview at Gersh Park. If you've been here with me since the first episode that we dropped covering Gersh, Mr. Gary Irvin, G. Irv. Welcome to the set. Talk to me. How are you? I'm great, man. It's been long overdue. Definitely Appreciate long it, overdue. Appreciate Definitely. It. Um, like I said in the beginning, you were one of my first uh, Gersh Park interviews post game, and one of the things you told me was uh, you was you're one of the you're the CP3 of the team. I never forget it. Um, at that point, you know, when when I start getting a feel for players, I'm trying to see what they're about, you know, off the court, on the court, and uh, this is let's just say this is my opportunity to definitely get to know you as the man, Gary Irvin, and not just the basketball player that I've been seeing for the past few months. Um, but let's get straight into it. Uh, I have a few questions. We'll de go deep into the life that you've lived. You've told your story in different ways. Um, first and foremost, let's start off. You dropped a documentary recently called uh, This Urban is Magic on YouTube. Um, if you guys haven't seen it, I, I advise you guys to go see it. If you don't know the man that you're looking at today, um, just what was behind that, uh, that documentary and why did you <coughs> decide to drop something like that at this point in your life? Um... Once again, like it was long overdue, <clears throat> but, um, you know, just from being able to play for a long time, you know, it's a lot of people and um, me dealing with the youth, I thought it was important for me to bring out my story and, you know, how it started and <clears throat> the trials and tribulations that, you know, I had to go through to get to, you know, where I'm at now. Uh -huh. You know, these days, um, these kids don't understand that hard work and dedication is what it's all about. But on the okay. flip side is you're going to get, you know, um, to where you're stuck and you don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to fight your way out of it. You know, I thought that if they're able to see me and, and who I am, somebody that's been through it, somebody that has been all over the world, that's played with the greats, you know, like LeBron and Carmelo, the CP3s, you know, that you can reach out and, you know, touch and speak and talk to me. But um I thought that that was the main point is that I just wanted to get it out for the youth so they could understand really who I'm who I am, you know, as a as a person and as a basketball player for the simple fact that they really don't know their history about basketball. So, you don't know <laughs> who's coaching and you know who you're talking to. So, I thought that that was important. Definitely got to know your history, you know, all facets of life. Um, so let's I did watch the uh documentary. Of course, I had no choice. I can't have you on the show and not watch the documentary. <laughs> but um I want to just, first off, it, it gives us a nice timeline of your journey. Um, so, of course, you told your journey in your own way. I'm trying to bring out some other things and put some light on certain things that I saw in that uh, documentary. I feel like I can get you to speak more on. First and foremost, um, getting out of your neighborhood. In the beginning, you walked through uh, your apartment in Gowan, is correct? Correct. Um, and it, it showed me that you haven't been there in a while uh, based off of your basketball um career and where high school went off of but before we get into high school and everything just talk about that feeling getting back to your hood and what it meant for you to knowing that you've gone through so much been in different parts of the world and your hood still like acts the same because in, in that video there was a point where you know like regular hood shit people talk and people get into arguments you know the, the neighborhood people so like just talk to me what was that feeling as you walk in there and it's like not much change but there's a different there's a different feeling to it still um I felt at home, mm. you know, honestly. Um, you definitely don't forget those memories and, Never. you know, how your childhood was and, you know, your upbringing. So I thought that it was real dope to do. Um, I'm, I usually go to Gowanus a lot, but it's more of the, the, the standpoint of just hanging around my peers and the people that I grew up with, you know, seeing their mothers and their grandmothers and things like that, not mm -hmm. actually being able to go inside the building, <clears throat> you know. But 
it did bring back some memories. You know, it it, it brought back some 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 great ones and some bad ones. You know, um, I lost one of my uh, my brothers. You know, to uh, to uh, to gun violence mm-hmm. with the police. You know, so um, at a young age, I, I I lost my guard brother to playing cops and robbers inside our inside our uh, our neighborhood, and it was killed by the police. So I thought that you know that's something that's always in the back of my mind when I go there. But then we have some you know some funny and special memories. Definitely. You know, just as you can see in the documentary, and mm-hmm. you know with you know the arguments and the talking, you know the regular hood yeah. stuff, the yeah. hood shit. But I thought that it was just important for me to go there and. You know, just to see where I was at, you know, to start and, you know, how I was able to um, to um, to finish, you know, because you don't know the outcome, you Never. know. So, really, who knows what would have happened if I would have stayed there, you know, throughout my whole childhood and never moved out. So, you referenced uh, uh, a brother that you lost. We'll definitely get to him. I don't want to skip that over. Um, but let's go down this timeline. Um, now, we're, we're in high school, right? And... Uh, in the documentary, I believe um, one of your, I forgot who it was, but one of your mans was saying that you was playing baseball before this basketball stuff was going on, yeah. right? And he said you were actually pretty good at, at, at baseball. So tell me about your transition as you, you went from a baseball player in, I believe, junior high school to someone that's handling the rock, going up against ninth graders as a junior high schooler, high schoolers. Like, so tell me, what was, what was that transition and when did it click to you? Like, okay, this is, baseball is no longer for me. I mean, I thought that really I was doing more than just baseball, but okay. you know, I was playing football. Mm-hmm. I did uh, street hockey. I was doing everything. street hockey. Yeah, it sounds crazy, <laughs> but I was doing everything. You know, I was mm-hmm. just one of those people that was just really just the athlete. You know, like something I was just, I was just born with. But um, baseball was really my first love. I enjoyed it. You mm-hmm. know, I was really good at it. You know, because of my speed and my hand and eye coordination. So I thought that. You know, that's something that I love to do. But once I was, once I seen my best friend, uh, um, Superbub, um, come to school and was saying that he's going away. I'm like, going away? Bro, you my best friend. How you get opportunity to go away and play basketball? And I don't know nothing about it. Yeah. You know, so like, I I, I think that that's when the switch kind of clicked once I started actually playing basketball and um, going to Brooklyn USA tryouts. I thought that once I started to, you know, do that, I just fell in love with basketball and baseball wasn't really an option. You know, I, I used to just do it for fun. It's kind of like a swap. Okay, okay. So so in the in the documentary, you, you went back home and you saw someone by the name of Miss Washington. Um, describe um, hometown connections, just simple as that, uh, someone that you've, that you've been in their home, you've interacted with their children, <clears throat> stuff like that. Like what, it is, what do those connections mean to you? when you go back home or just in general connections you you make throughout your life that stand there for decades? I mean, I think that that's what it's all about. You know, I don't really, uh, you know, think that a lot of people, and especially the elders, remember you from the basketball and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. They remember those those old memories, you know, when you was a child and, you know, you was in their house and you was walking to school with them, you know, things like that. But it's also a blessing to see those people still alive, you know, um, um, through everything that was going on. But I'm one of those guys that I cherish the memories because I think that those are the things that really lives on. You you, you don't remember a lot of stuff. Yeah. What if she never seen me play basketball a day in my life? Mm-hmm. Only thing she has is that those we used to walk to school and, together. Up and down the she used to bring me run up and down the hallways, you know, whatever it was, getting in trouble, you know, like just the normal, you know, life of, of, of a – of a young child in poverty. So I thought mm-hmm. that that was just dope to actually have her a part of something so special, even though that we haven't, you know, been around, you know, I haven't seen her in a long time besides just, you know, my here and there summer, you know, days popping up and, you know, just, yeah, you the know, love is genuine. Like the, the love has always been there no matter what. And I think that that's something that, you know, you cherish because, you know, some people forget, but then there's others that, you know, remember everything, you know, and I thought that that was real big, you know, to, to, to be a part of. All right. So let's, let's keep it moving. So we get to Paul Robeson high school where it seems that once basketball kicked in at Paul Robeson, you felt like this was, this is where I need to make it happen. Um, there was a point, as you explained in the documentary that 
you lost your way in terms of being the student athlete before you even got to college, <laughs> right? So you said grades held you back. From from what I understood, and correct me if I'm wrong, you didn't get to really play big minutes in high school, if I'm correct, until your junior, senior year um, because of academics. Is that correct? Um, and just touch a light on kind of why that was. Um, I was able to play part of my freshman year, mm. and I was a big part of the team. Um but, you know, as a freshman, you go through certain stuff, especially back in the day where, you know, everybody was really good. <laughs> um, so I was able to play half of a season. But, you know, <clears throat> when you're a freshman, you don't know what to expect. You just enter in high school. You know, you see it on TV. You've been, you you know, you go to games. But it's real once you get there. And you kind of tend to get lost in the, the hype. You know, you get lost in – you know, what's going on at, at a legendary school. And, mm -hmm. you know, I was one of those people that I let it affect me in the classroom, you know, kind of almost, you know, not almost, got the big head, you know. You know how it goes, you know, you're a freshman. Yeah. You, you, you know, you're on a big stage. People know your name now. You know, like, you start paying attention to girls, you know, you got seniors that's, you know, talking to Trying you. To see that's, what this, you know, this, this, yeah, this guy's so. About. You know what I mean? Like, so I think I got lost in the sauce, and I thought that <clears throat> that was something that actually, in a long haul, it made me who I am. You know, like I was able to go through the stuff at a younger age. So now when I'm getting older, those little bumps in the roads didn't really affect me because it happened before. And once I was able to get, you know, a, a second chance, I just, you know, I just ran with it. So this is a... I'm telling you guys, you got to go watch this documentary. But um, yeah, a guy named uh, Neef in there, he said this quote, and this quote definitely stuck out to me. He says, Gary took something from every one of us, and he took it and basically accumulated it into his game, and he's just a genius. So what do you think Neef <clears throat> meant by that? Because I see off the on the face, not knowing you personally, you look like a soft-spoken brother. Mm -hmm. But then when you get on the court, is there's a switch there. Right. So so tell to me about that being able to. OK, like I'm from this place. I grew up here. I played ball here, but I know about this, this and this like this. This is what makes me me. How did you how were you able to do that and just define that quote by Neef for me, please? That's kind of funny because Neef was supposed to be here. He was supposed <laughs> to be here. So that's just that's dope that you even asked that question. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it's just it's just who I am. You know, like, we know in life, forget just basketball. And I tell my kids this, mm -hmm. <clears throat> that I coach. You can learn something from everybody, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. And I always talk to them about, you can learn from a bum because you can learn not to go down that path. You know, like, so for me, like, um, I had my cousin Neef. You know, I had a guy in my neighborhood, KB. You know, I had my best friend. One of my best friends, Superbub. I had mm -hmm. my brother, Zoe Pound. I had my uncle, <clears throat> all my uncles, Andre, Mike, Ross, and, you know, and the list goes on. And Uncle Amp, you know, who all played the game of basketball. So I took everything from everyone and, you know, try to, you know, put it into one to become a better basketball player and a better person. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, that's what it's about. You look at the greats now, and yeah. they took something from every single person and, you know, just tried to, you know, change it a little bit, you know, to become who they are. And I thought that that's what um, um, that's what I did. Um, I hear a lot of people say that, you know, kind of funny, not really too much of the genius part that, you know, my cousin Neef said, but more of the, you know, that I'm smart in my IQ. And it's just because <clears throat> when you want to be great, you know, this is what you have to do. You know, it, 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 you have to put in that work. You know, you have to watch the greats. You know what I mean? Like, and I thought that that's something that I really, really did, you know, to become who I am. Okay, okay. So, Paul Robeson High School, like you said, uh, didn't get much time freshman year. Didn't play second year, correct? Correct. Uh, correct and then correct. and then you were able to catch the city by storm junior and senior year. Um before we get to the ins and outs of the junior and senior year, uh, Adidas ABC camp, top players in the country. You, I believe, you won the championship of that tournament, correct? Correct. Um, just describe that atmosphere of being a guy that okay, 
I know you don't get you don't look for media validation or camp validation, but as a basketball player, when you get invited to these things, this is your opportunity to show out. So what was it like being in a room with other guys wanting to eat off the same plate you just or you just got? Like talk to me about that that intensity of basketball or that basketball at that time in, in, in the early two thousands, late nineties. Like what was it like having to grind and grind and grind and being at this these at these places with the bright lights? Um, I thought that it was just, <clears throat> it was just something that I was waiting for. Um, to a lot of people, um, it was, they thought I took it by storm, but at the end of the day, I was just, you know, waiting to thrive in those situations. I know who I am. I know my mentality. I mean, you said it best that I'm probably, you know, kind of chill and laid back if people don't know me, but on that basketball court, I'm a, I'm a killer. So I just wanted to to get that opportunity. I'm not one of those guys that really pay attention to the rankings or any of that, but you know, I hear people, okay, he's this he's this good or he's number 1 or he's number 2 and mm -hmm. that right there within itself is 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 enough, you know, fuel that's added to the fire, you know, for me, but um I always thought I was the best and I thought that that was one of the things that kept me going is that I felt I was the best, but I just wanted to showcase my talent on a on a on a higher stage, and I was able to get that opportunity, and I wasn't gonna shy away from it because I know that you usually don't get a lot of opportunities in life to to showcase on a big stage like that. Every <laughs> college coach that you can imagine, you know, <laughs> it's the first time that you can actually have a college coach call you. You know, have every college coach you can imagine, Coach K, Roy. Um, John Chaney, mm -hmm. you know, like the list goes on. Lute Olsen, you know, Bill Self. You know, it's a lot, yeah. you know. So I thought that some people get starstruck or, you know, like get frightened by it. And I was just like, hey, this is your opportunity to, you know, let people know who Gary Irvin is. And I thought that that was the the the, the start of who I really am. And that's why in the documentary you see this Irvin is magic because mm -hmm. it was the actual – picture of me at ABCD camp and and that's how we got that so let's talk about New York City basketball so of course as you started to make a name for yourself there was someone else as you say across across Brooklyn in Sebastian Telfair right and um I don't want to put too much into some may say it was a rivalry but I basketball is basketball at some point there comes two guys that I have to put on for their squads and basketball is a unique sport where one person can change the tide of a game. Um, talk to me about what New York City, not, you can talk to me about the basketball, but I want to know what the aura was like in New York City back in those days where there was no, there's not social media of somebody being like, okay, I just saw this guy drop 40 in a game in a high school. Oh, I just saw this guy do this. You got to wait for the back page. Talk to me about the aura of New York City basketball at that time when you and Sebastian were just making a name for yourselves on respective opposite sides of Brooklyn? Um, it was crazy. Um, honestly, in my first two years of, you know, being at Port Robeson, I don't know if I if I paid attention to it mm -hmm. or it just wasn't there, but it just felt like those last two years of, of, of high school basketball was just something epic and special, you know, because uh, you had two guys that were close friends, and brothers mm. that was turned into quote unquote enemies. I mean, we had a little conversation earlier. We know how we talked about the media, the media and how they can yeah. change it, or you know, people can change the narrative, of, the narrative of things. And it was just dope to see one person scoring forty. You got to wait to look in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. Then you got to go try to score forty. You know, like it was, it was, it was something epic. And uh, it's so sad, honestly, <clears throat> that. It wasn't no social media, you know, to be able to watch the footage so people could understand the difference in, you know, every generation, you know, of basketball. Because I think that we probably had one of the best generations or the best few years of, of high school basketball in the history of New York City, if you ask me. That's really untold because there's no footage. Talk to me, though. Talk to me, though, because when, when you say that statement, right, This I want to get the years <laughs> right because, like you said, like we said, there's no social media. What was, like, from, let's say, late 90s to 2004-ish? Yeah. Am, I, am I correct in yeah, that statement? Yeah, 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 you're, you're um, correct. So, like, we get, we me as a millennial, I still consider myself in that, in that, in that, in that age as me as being 23. Yeah. But 
I, I, the old heads, I don't want to call you old, but the OGs always talk about that time. I to say 80s to 90s, like it was just a different time, especially New York. Like, why do you think, like, compare the basketball that we play today to that? Like, what is, what do you think is the biggest difference and why you, and why you wish so much that there was social media? Like, what made your basketball, your, your level of basketball different from what we see right now? I think because, you know, every generation, you know, it changes. You know, I can't speak too much about the 80s, but, you know, you mm -hmm. have my uncles and my family members that can talk about that. Then you have us that can talk about the late 90s to the early 2000s. And I think that the difference is that we just still had that hunger and that grit, you know. And who knows if social media would have changed that, mm. you know, because we still don't know if social media changed our hunger and our grit when it comes to the generation that was after us. You know, but just to have, or quote unquote, if we could say, if it was a fly on a wall, you know, that could, you know, paint that picture to yeah. show how it really was. Because it was just battles. You know, you watch today's game and it's just too much friendly basketball, the what's ups, <laughs> the laughing, the joking. <laughs> it was no joking on court. I'm on court to kill you. Facts. You know what I mean? It's nothing else but that. After we can hug, joke, laugh, but no, it's, it's, it's no fun in games. It's a war. And mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, depending on who you are, if you lose that game, you might not still speak to the person. Right. You know what I mean? Like I that that's guy. because that's who we that's who we are. And mm -hmm. that was our aura. And that was, you know, what people across the country didn't want to see. When you go to ABCD camp or you go to your AAU tournaments, they know what what's gonna happen when you playing against somebody from New York. <laughs> you know, you had that bully mentality, you know, kinda like that. Yeah. Being a thug, you know, um, and that's what a lot of college coaches actually liked about New York, you know. So I thought that I think that that was the biggest thing about our generation compared to now to where it's buddy, buddy. And, you know, it's really based on your skill and your potential and everything else. But before it was just your hunger, you know, your attitude and your will to, you know, want to win and, and, and do what you love. What do you say to those? Because it's funny how you bring that up. But what do you say to those that um that believe that that type of basketball where you're not quote unquote friendly with the person across the, the 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 lines from you like what do you say to those that say like that's not a way to play like the animosity shouldn't always be there because we're at the end of the day playing a game like what do you say to those because they, they say that's in the nba now they say that in just basketball period like the that fight where you technically don't really like that person on the court right now like you just see all the guys like describe that like what do you say to those that that don't really feel like that logic it should be applied to basketball anymore or sports, period. Everything's about a competitive nature. You know, you say it's a game, but this game could take you a long way in life. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, and and, and and you never should take it for granted because you don't know when is the last time that you could step on that court, you know, do anything else that you love. So you got to step in between them lines and you got to give it, you know, your all. And, and like I said, it's different. In generations, you know, it's just the life of the sport and how everything changes. But I can't even play a pickup game and joke around and BS because of who I am. You know, yeah. I love it and I don't take it for granted, mm -hmm. you know, and you don't get to do it for for your entire life. So if you can just get in between those lines and give it your all and, you know, you certain people want to be remembered for that. And I think... uh you just think about the people like, I'm going to say the recent people, like Kevin um, Garnett. Mm. You know, I watched his documentary. Yeah. I watched a few, but his touched me because it was just dope. His competitive nature, who he was, you know, how he carried himself. Um, it was, it, it felt like me, <laughs> you know. Um, people don't like Patrick Beverly, which is one of my backcourt mates. Why? Because he only know how to play one way. He know how to talk shit. Mm -hmm. He know how to play 94 feet. Getting your and girl. people don't like that because that's not that's how not you what play the game is anymore. in today's, yeah. you know, day and age. And and that's why he's hated. But if he was one of those that was just fitting in and just, you know, playing and, you know, joking. But, you know, taking it a little serious, you would never hear no disrespect about Patrick Beverly. Ever. But it's just because how hard he plays day in and day out that it's a real problem and they take it as him trying to hurt people 
But nah, he just, he really, just know how to play one way. He, he really comes from poverty. Like he got it out the mud. You know, like it wasn't given to him. People say that he's not skilled and whatever they want to say. Mm-hmm. He's one of the best shooters I've played with. So I know who he is. Mm-hmm. But people wouldn't see that. You got to find a way. And it's about finding a way for you to put food in your family and your kids' mouths. Right? Definitely. Only the strong survive. Only. You know, so that was our mentality, and I'm always going to live by that. Say no more. So let's go down the timeline again. So now we get from uh, Paul Robeson High School to now going to college. Yo, Jeff, we going to let him skip senior year, or oh. we just going to go to college? <laughs> All right, well, I'm asking you. I'm putting you a part of the podcast. So we going to allow that, or we going to speak about senior year? Whoa, whoa, whoa. So, so. Ooh. <laughs> So, so as the guy who I don't know if y'all heard that, but like like he said, Gary Irvin averaged a triple double, and everybody he saw was food senior year. So, so tell me something that I missed. So clearly, I've missed something. What what from senior year that that just that just flipped the switch on your chest just now? Like, talk to me. What is it? What is it there that was that was so memorable for you in your junior year, your senior year of high school? Um, like you said, you see my documentary. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of stuff that. I didn't put in there, mm-hmm. you know, for certain reasons. Okay. For podcasts, for one-on-one questions when I get together with everybody. But I think it was just, um, you say you take the city, the city by storm. I think it was more of not just the city, but the country at that time. You know, like it started with the city, but um, I did a lot of epic things that, you know, I don't speak about. And people always tell me that I'm just too humble. You know, sometimes and sometimes you got to get out of that cool, humble bullshit. So, Mm -hmm. you know, that it was just one of those things that he's right. Everybody that was put in front of me got killed. It wasn't, you know, really a game to where I went at it with anybody. And I think it's more so because it was just long overdue. I missed two years and I felt like I had to get everything back in two years. Um and you hear a lot of people talk about what everybody else did, but I almost scored 2,000 points in my last two years of high school basketball. I scored 56 points and 30 was in the last four minutes. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I remember that. <laughs> in, 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 in the playoffs, I scored my team's last 32 points. You know what I mean? Like It's just certain stuff that you really can't skip. I went from not being ranked to being top three point guard in the country. There's a lot of stuff that's never talked about. And – and sometimes you got to be happy about your accomplishments, you know, because I earned it. Mm-hmm. Like, you say you got it out the mud. Like, I really got it out the mud, you know. Like, who's to say what it means to get it out the mud, but hard work and dedication did it for me. You, you know speak, what I mean? You spoke of the underdog mentality in that documentary, and – why do you gravitate towards that way of thinking, the way of taking everything that you felt like you should have and probably didn't get to have at a certain point? Why where does that where does that come from? Where does the fire in your chest come from? Where does it where did it originate to where it's like I'm sorry, but this is just I gotta go get that. This is this is me. This is this is what I gotta do because at the end of the day, this is me versus you who's getting the who's getting to the chicken, who's getting to the bread. Like, where does that fire come from when you talk to me, when you talk to people about the past or even present now? Where does it come from? It's a doggy dog world. You know what I mean? I lived, you know, with those type of people, like my family members, my uncles, my friends. You know, like, that's who we are. You know what I mean? And you're a product of your environment. You know, Mm -hmm. we are all underdogs when you live. And poverty, or you come from poverty. Like, you from the hood, you're underdog. They don't expect us to do certain stuff. They don't expect us to go to college. They don't expect us to get a degree. They don't expect us to have a great job. You know, so that was one of those things to where, like, I missed so much. But I also have family members that did it, you know, that know what it takes. You know, so I did come, and I was an underdog, you know. Um, and I think that that might have been the reason why I did make it is because of being an underdog. You see a lot of these guys that don't know how to 
handle adversity when it hits because they have so much stuff handed to them. Mm -hmm. And then you have some people like me that didn't have it handed to me and I had to go and get it. Like it was never a handout. And that's why every time I had to face adversity, I came out on top because of all the things that I had to go through as a, as a youngin. So there was a point where uncle Ross, he said, uh, I forget the timeline. I believe it was going into college, but I believe there was a point where Ross was Ross said, uh, when G Earl fell off, I stopped talking to him. Uh, was that going into college or was that still still that was still part of high school? No, that was that was that was my uh my freshman year. Uh, that uh, was when I fell that when I fell when I fell off the team. Yeah. Oh for for, yeah. for 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 Robeson. Okay, when for I Robeson. Fell, yeah, when okay, I fell okay. off. So when you yeah. see when you see I, I wanted to get to Uncle Ross later, but let's let's bring him up. When you see he it brings me back to influences. Everybody has someone in their life that pushes them a certain way, been there most of the time. Um, describe the impact of Uncle Ross on your life, pushing you through basketball and not just basketball, just as a man, period. Um, it was big. You know, he's one of those guys who actually took the time and he put that time in with me, walking from street light to street light, <laughs> dribbling the basketball with my left hand, stopping at the stop sign. I was stopping at the uh at the crosswalk and getting up there and doing ten pull ups you know, and doing push-ups, you know. So he was definitely a big part of my success and what I had to do as a basketball player. Um, but it is one person that is not talked about in the documentary who's mm. probably had the biggest influence on me. You know, everybody know that your parents have those influences, so that's just a given. But my Uncle Mike. Irvin, who's probably my best friend, my father, my uncle, my <laughs> brother. You know, everything that you can imagine in life, that's who he is. So people don't understand, and the people that's been around me, they know, like, he's that person. You know, for me, like, you have that person. Everybody feels his Uncle Ross. He's definitely that person. But Mike Irvin is that person. You know what I mean? Like, everything that I wanted to do in life, you usually want to make your parents happy. My mm -hmm. parents was already proud of me. I wanted validation from my uncle. You know what I mean? Because he was the person that helped me with everything. When it came to basketball, when it came to what college is, you know, somebody to talk to. You know, when you in college and you need money, he's sending me five, six hundred dollars just because of that's who he was. You know, like not just because of who I am as a basketball player, it's more of because I'm handling my business the right way. So he's able to, you know. Show me that, you know, so um, I want everybody that's watching this to understand that if you don't know nothing about me, just know that Mike Irvin is one of those people that, you know, made it uh, happen for me, you know, and you probably won't see him because he's at Gersh Park. But when he at Gersh, he's probably all the way by the he by probably the, by, see me. He, pro he, pro <laughs> he probably by the red the red house, the, mm. the bathroom. I'm and weak. watching the game from there, he's one of those that he's on the outside looking so, so, in, but he still knows everything, no nah, matter what. That. You might not think he's there, might not think he's not supporting. And to this day, from a young kid, 38 years old playing basketball, he's still there. One of my biggest supporters, you know, from me as a basketball player to me as the coach, he always wanted the best for me. You know what I mean? And, that, and, and it's rare that you get to see that, you know, throughout life. You think that once you get older that – the support is not there. Not actually, as I got older, the support is there probably even more than it was when I was in high school. So he was one of those people that when I did fell off, he wasn't speaking to me. All my uncles wanted to whip my ass and stuff like that. <laughs> so like, just know that I really, when they say that it takes a village to, to raise a child, shit, I had a village plus more. Shit, let alone, it's probably over 100 <laughs> and 50 of us as urban as it is yeah. you know just imagine everybody else from the neighborhood and other neighborhoods you know and um that was real important to me so uh just before we get to high school just before we get to the college part um i do have one more question where uh aau where you're going all over the country playing with all these different kind of players playing against these different kind of players jordan classics uh mcdonald's all american if i'm correct uh Playing with guys that I'm, I'm still watching on TV. You sitting next to Michael Jordan in a Jordan Classic photo, like that's some Hollywood shit. 
coming from a guy from Brooklyn, got it out the mud, playing with these players that have now become or were already the greatest of all times and people that you will never forget. So you being that guy straight out of Brooklyn in this space where most of these players you played with or against ended up on the, the same TVs, the same teams that we watch and cheer for today. Like when you call, when it all comes full circle to you, for you and you look at that, it's like, what, what, are, what goes through your mind? Because these were, these were one of the, the primes of your career. Um, that's funny because a lot of people said that I missed out on talking about my AU career on a documentary. Um, it all it all starts again, like with the confidence. I felt I belong. I showcased my talent to show that I belong. Um, when it comes full circle, you know, I smile about it. You watch the Chris Pauls, the Mellows, you mm -hmm. know, the LeBrons, and they're, they're all time greats. Those are all Hall of Famers, and on the same court as them, they still know who I am. Mm. You know, no matter what, you know, everybody thought the end goal was the NBA, but as a youngin, you don't know, it's God's plan, you know, so my story was already written, you know, and one of those, like we talking about it now, was to be able to talk about who I've played with and played against and things like that, but um, you always want to be on the stage to be in the NBA, but I think that my stage was probably, you know, to do something, you know, other than playing the NBA. You know, so when I do look on the look on the court, and I watch, you know, a ton of other guys that's in the NBA that I've played against, and I always smile about it because we have those conversations with my bros, like you know Jeff, Neef, Veli, and it's like, <laughs> if you didn't bust my ass, you're still not better than me. It doesn't <laughs> matter if you're in the NBA or anything. Gangster. You know, it's just how you know the cards were dealt. You know, some people don't go through certain things, and some people, you know have a clean slate, and, you know, the gates is open for them. I was just one of those to where I had to go through the trials and tribulations and the bumps and the roads, and it just so happened that the NBA wasn't for me. You know, so now it's about doing what's, you know, embedded, and I'm still able to do that. Um, I'm still living a good life. I'm healthy. <laughs> you know, I'm smiling. And at 38, I'm still busting people's ass. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, we'll we'll get to the thirty eight still busting people ass. We'll get there, but um, the the your college career started at Mississippi State, and then you transferred to Arkansas, where where you took advantage of that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Um, just D one basketball, NCAA tournaments, SEC SEC championship games. You've seen it all, right? What was that? What was the probably your prime moment for you in college where you sat there and said? man like I'm, I'm just really here like that one moment where you're like you look around and it's just like wow i just have to take this in you know i think for for most it would probably be sweet 16s and you know being in ncaa tournaments and you know being on one shiny moment you know hmm. those are some of the things i was able to you know accomplish but i think the biggest for me or when i thought like wow i i'm here had to be my freshman year against Kentucky mm. um, at home, white out. Mississippi. Um, yeah. At Mississippi State. Um, and, you know, Dick Vitale, you already know the 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 diaper dandy talk, you know. <laughs> so um, I thought that that was the biggest, you know, for me, just a guy, you know, from Brooklyn who probably never thought he would be able to play college basketball like I said missing two two years of high school failing off and you know kind of BSing not understanding you know where my talents could take me but just to play in that game and you know like it was great in the moment but then out of the moment watching it hearing Dick Vitale you know say that Gary Irvin the freshman should be starting the second half you know senior All-American guards don't have nothing for him and mm -hmm. you know to hear Tubby Smith at half at halftime to say that the kid Gary Irvin is you know just doing what he wanted against us I think that that was a big time moment for me and that's when it was like damn like you arrived bro like you know like you doing something that a lot of people it, it, like they, they can't, can't they, they, they can't, can't even a dream imagine you know like when I think of it I think of you know people like Ed Booger Smith you know who was probably one of the greatest players to ever play basketball mm. you know in New York and you know 
anywhere else. Um, another guy, KB Kwanzaa from my neighborhood, who you've seen in the documentary. Oh, trust me, I ain't forget. He was one of my 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 young OGs because he ain't old. But you know, like people like that, you know. So when I was able to get those moments, mm -hmm. it was like almost like this is for you. You know what I mean? Like. You didn't get to do it, but you have young people that look up to y'all or that respect y'all enough to where they still going to keep y'all name alive. So um, at Arkansas, uh, <laughs> you experienced a death in the family, a passing. Uh, we, we spoke about it earlier, but uh, he's a relative of yours, Naj. Um, you lost a brother, to uh, sadly, to police brutality. As you are going to new heights in your life on and off the court, what was it like? losing someone where you felt that you were on top of the world like you said sweet 16s dick vital is telling it speaking of your name freshman year of your of your college career like when it gets to these moments of tragedy especially brothers i don't want to harp on it too much but at the end of the day we all have something driving us but what was it like to possibly be at the height of your life and then fall down so so far mentally what did it do to you and how did it pick you back up at the same time um you know for some people you know it could have been worse some people take it you know a certain way but um i'm almost a little even killed mm. um sometimes i'm thankful for it and sometimes it's like damn like what do you care about you know just because of i don't know my mentality but when that happened with nigel you know that hit as close as you know it could get to home you know that was my one of my best friends my brother you know somebody that i actually looked up to and he was only two years older than me um mm -hmm. he was one of those people that wasn't given the opportunities that i was given you know and he was probably my 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 favorite player <laughs> you know six four six three can handle it can shoot from half you know what i mean like and the biggest of all is that he brought everybody together, you know, and, and, and that's the, you know, the hardest part, you know, like, um, he's my daughter's godfather, you know, but I was able to handle it in a way that I'm still shocked about. And, you know, sometimes you kind of get at ease that, you know, okay, it's been a long time, but it, it, it doesn't feel that way, you know, for me so as of yet, I still... You know, certain days it hits home, but the reason I wasn't able to harp on it so much or let it break me down mentally is because I knew what he wanted for me, and he was probably my biggest fan, and I've actually learned that as time went by, hearing other people Talk about, that was yeah. around it, how he talked about me. You know, usually don't tend to talk about people like that, you know, to each other in which, you know, you should because you don't know how long this person is going to be with you you know so i was able to understand that you know after the fact um and it was kind of you know it's it's kind of tough to go through that yeah so. you know like for anybody you know like but just especially a person like that you know um who was a dope individual no matter what forget basketball yeah forget you basketball know, basketball is not even the biggest thing about him you know so I thought that, you know, he's always going to live on. You know, I got a tattoo of him. I go see his mom all the time, you know, mm -hmm. and it's not because, you know, of the cl of the clout because I came from a, a place where it wasn't no social media. It's all yeah, loyalty and all love, you know, so it's just national. It's just natural, I mean. And she still has a son, you know, that checks on her. And she knows what her son means to me and everybody that's around me. So um, that's never going to die down. Real stuff, real stuff. Um, as we transition, you <clears throat> had your, you, you of course, you declared for the draft, um, the NBA draft, went undrafted and uh, got to the D-League. Um, and you caught it as uh, not much recognition from the D-League, even though you're grinding, trying to still fulfill your dream or what you thought was your dream at that point. Um, just describe uh, the comparisons of what possibly the coming up processes for now for athletes where it's not it's no longer the d-league the d-league was looked at in a certain way for some time until the name changed and certain players started being able to come up in the g-league now 
Uh, do you think, do you ever think about if you came up in this day and age, the difference in the difference in recognition, the, the, the under league gets from the NBA, uh, because I'm not going to lie to you, I didn't really respect the, the D-League when it was the D-League. And then once the name changed and more players are coming up and you're seeing them on the NBA stage, does do you, does it ever, you know, go in the back of your head like, man, if there was actually more TV games for me or was there actually more scouts at this game or just what was your mindset as you see now the the, the, the new age of basketball players coming up through that? Um, I think that that's that's more for my peers. Mm. And my family members and my friends and everybody else to kind of <clears throat> what if <clears throat> I'm not a what if person. Yeah. You know, like I said, like I'm one of those people that I'm straightforward with it. I mean, like I really don't care. You know, um, I look at it, but it doesn't really matter because it doesn't guarantee you that you're going to get to the NBA just yeah. because just cause I TV was brought there, up, or, yeah. you know, in that situation. You know, it's more of um it's dope now, you know, because I'm still able to talk about it, mm-hmm. you know, when it wasn't like this, you know, to understand that these kids need to still grind and don't think that because you see everybody else going to the G League and going to the NBA that it's for you. Mm-hmm. You know, you still got to grind. So um, we all know in life everything evolves and, you know, it gets better, you know, with time, you know like the iPhones and everything else yeah. in life, you know? So that's just what it was. Like, you know, I was in a place to where I was on a platform that I was able to be a part of something that was going to gradually get better and open up the doors for a lot of other people, you know? And sometimes that's what you are brought here for. Okay. So, uh, so the next chapter of your life was overseas basketball, going to Australia, NBL, Accolades speak for itself over there. MVP, first team all, all team, second, second team all team, um, and the championship. Like I said, just what was what's what's overseas basketball like? Because uh, from from what I can see, uh, when when American players get there, they add a little bit more intensity or a little bit more uh, athleticism, depending on where you go. Um, just describe that atmosphere compared to the, all the different atmospheres that you've played in. Um. Overseas is definitely different, you know, compared to it. You know, it's because of, um, first of all, it's professional, you know. So you got to really put in that work and grind because if you're not performing, then you go home, you know. So it's, you know, it's it's a business, you know. You, you Earlier we talked about how the game is fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the game is fun, but there's also, you know, some seriousness to it or more seriousness because now you're older, you got families that you, you know, you're trying to support and stuff like that. And you just got to find a way to kind of, you know, have that even kill. But um, it was just dope from a standpoint of, um, you know, just being in different countries, you know, getting to explore, you know, different parts of life, you know. I don't think I ever would have thought that I would be playing overseas, like I say, let alone just playing basketball at a certain level too. But I think what's really, really um, underestimated and people think that it's about basketball when you're overseas. It's not about basketball. Mm. It's not about basketball. It's about having those connections with your friends and your families to keep you sane. You got to understand you're away for 10 months out of a year you know, a different country where they probably don't speak that, you know, the same language, you know, they eat different foods and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. I thought that the reason why I was able to even be who I am as a basketball player was, you know, having my peoples, you know, that I was able to talk to. If anybody know, hmm. when I'm overseas, I don't talk to a lot of people, which is crazy. But my brother Jeff, who's here right now, mm-hmm. my uncles, my best friends, my cousins, niefs and everybody else, Everybody else kind of get like, you know, not really pushed back, but, you know, your world gets a lot smaller, you know, because you don't have a lot of time to talk to a lot of people, you know, so you got to make sure it's with your loved ones, you know, and you still got to realize and understand that social media still wasn't that big back then either, still at the time, you know, so it's just a selective, got to think about it. I was there when it was Skype. Mm. It wasn't a lot of other stuff. It no, was Skype. Across the water on Instagram, you know I mean? showing off yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like you know, it was it, it was like that, and um, I don't think without those guys, 
I would have been able to actually perform on a basketball court to a certain level because it's tough. It's really tough. Okay, okay. You know. So, so now um, I want to get into a different thing that I had uh, in store. Uh, how do I want to say it? The last time we saw you on a basketball court, or at least the hood saw you, in NYC basketball saw you, street basketball, was in a SOG jersey uh, playing, playing your heart out. Uh, you guys lost in a in a three games final series to Sean Bell. Um, I believe if I paid attention to your Instagram at the time, you said one of the lowest points in your life was during those stretch of games or games after that. To my knowledge, I remember you you injured your foot, your toe, and I remember I don't know if you remember, but in the playoffs after the injury, I came up to you uh, pre game and was like, "Yo, that foot good?" Because I know when it got hurt, I seen it, I was right there, and I thought in the back of my head, I'm like, "I don't know if you're gonna play this game," because it looked bad. At least just your reaction. And you told me, I'm going to be good. And then those stretch of two games, you just you just couldn't miss. So talk about um that pain, that injury, some what people don't know about it. Because at that point, like you just said, like you said on the Instagram, you said this was probably one of the lowest points of your, your career, your life. And you played through a, a very devastating injury. Uh, just talk to me about that time, what was going through your mind, and um, why did you feel like you still had to be on the court when you had a serious foot injury um it's just who i am really <laughs> that's who i am hard nose don't care about nothing you know when it comes to playing that sport play with broken wrists mm. you know rip mouth you know concussion anything surgery in my knee um you know like it's just the will you know i know what it meant Really, not really to me, but what it meant to my neighborhood. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like we spoke about, I'm from Gowanus. Gowanus. From poverty. Straight out of Gowanus. You know That's the name like, of the team you were. So, so the biggest thing is, you know, this is their NBA championship. Mm. You know what I mean? If we was on the main stage and you got hurt like that, mm -hmm. would I have played? Yes. So what's the difference? You know what I mean? Like, I'm doing it for... Me, of course, but for people that believe in me. And the pain was crazy. I mean, people don't know what I had to go through. They don't understand. Like, it's a, um, my planner's plate was popped. Mm. You know, so in all reality, I mean, the doctors told me I was bugging. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, to even think about playing. But it was just like, to me, like, I played through so much injuries. You know, I wouldn't, I don't think, I thought this was probably or could have been the most difficult for the simple fact that it's your foot. Yeah. So you don't know and you got to adjust how every you run movement, and, plant. you know, every movement. But, you know, it was only two more games. You know, that's, <laughs> what I was, that's what I was saying, you know. But in all reality, my mindset really was that I wanted to try to play game one in which I really couldn't. Mm. And I was like, if we try to win game one, I can sit out game two. Mm-hmm and give him my all in game three. But it just, you know, it was just one of those things where if anybody knows me, I get to games early, you know. So if I definitely have the, the first game, I'm going to get there out early. I'm going to get shots up. I'm going to get loose. I'm going to get mentally prepared because that's who I am. That's all I know from overseas. That's mm -hmm. all I know from college. So it was like it was no difference. But once I started getting to that groove and I'm shooting and I make about 20, 30 in a row, not even exaggerating. I'm like, damn, like, y'all in for a long day. A long and I night. remember in that second game, and I told Ra, I said, I don't give a damn who you put on me, what's going on, I'm ready. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's just because, you know, my adrenaline was flowing and I felt good. Um, so we were able to get that win, whatever it was, why it happened, Ra yeah. taking the seam <laughs> off the court, wherever it You know, yeah. whatever happened, it happened. W is W. You know, W is W. And it's the same thing with game three. You know, I just promised myself that if I decide that I'm not going to play anymore, you know, as long as I'm here on this earth, mm -hmm. that I'm going to give it everything I got. And everybody that I spoke to during that day, that's the only thing I said. Mm -hmm. I'm going to leave it all on the court, no matter what it is, how it is, the outcome of the game. I got to be satisfied with it. And, you know, we struggled. You know, throughout the game, you know, like they were beating us by a few. We came back. You know, it's mm -hmm. like a roller coaster throughout the whole game. And I don't need nobody to really talk to me. 
to kind of hype me up when yeah. I'm playing a sport that I've been playing my whole life. But it was somebody on the sideline that was talking trash, you know, that kind of added a little bit more fuel to the fire, mm -hmm. you know, just to, you know, to show, you know, because when those doubters start doubting you, you know, the best thing you could do is prove somebody wrong. And I think that that's what happened. And I still kind of think about the game. I watch the game. And once I get to the end part of the last shot, I cut the game off. <laughs> and because the only reason, because I kept telling people on the side, I'm going to pull up for three for the game winner. Mm. But Kedar kind of came up, mm. so I had to go pass and I had to shoot a pull up. And I just know in my mind that when you think about something and you say you're going to do it, you should just do it. And I think the outcome would have been different. It would have been different. You know, like, so remember when I talked about the what ifs? Yeah. That's probably the only what if. What if I would have shot that three? Mm -hmm. I felt that how the day was going, how the story was supposed to be told, I should have shot that shot. So I wouldn't live in regret. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we're putting live we're back and let's continue the conversation I have with me, G. Irv. Um, last we were talking about was uh, Gersh Park Finals this past summer. Um, just to continue the conversation with that, there's a moment that I caught on camera between you and Keto. Mm -hmm. I felt it was a, a very nice, special moment. I almost didn't put it in the video, FYI, but I was <laughs> like, nah, this is too authentic. This is too real. This is too street. Um, basketball, competition, this leads back to what you were saying where like, yo, off the court, we could be mans, whatever, whatever, but on the court, it's war. Uh, that moment, some people on the face could look at it as, oh, this is real beef. And he spoke about generations and stuff like that. Um, where did that come from? Why, like... How like when people see that, what do you want them to think, or what do you want them to see when you when you go against somebody? It was just you know regular basketball play chippiness, upset that we're losing or upset that whatever the point of the game is not going your way, and you know Kedar is a person that talks a lot. So just describe a reaction to that after seeing it. I know you probably seen it, so seeing it afterwards, like hmm, okay maybe I didn't want to do this, or probably said it never said that. Like, is there any post reaction to that seeing it like? Anything that you just feel like, okay, eh, that's that's just what it was, regular stuff. That's just the life of the sport. I mean, I don't care, you know, honestly. Um, truth be told, I probably wouldn't have touched him. Mm. But, I mean, brothers fight. Facts. So who knows what would happen. But if anybody know me, don't talk shit to me, and especially while I'm losing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like like I say, certain generations say certain things, mm -hmm. and I'm not from that generation. I don't, you know. I don't rock that way. You know, yeah. not at all. You know what I mean? Like, so, but I know probably in the heat of the moment, things happen. Probably didn't mean no harm, but, you know, um, he does talk shit. Um, but um, he knows what it is. Like, that's my little brother, you know? Like, we're family, you know? And family fights. And in the no middle of competition, yeah, family fight. Yeah, family you know fights. what I mean? Like, so it wasn't nothing personal at all. You know what I mean? I love him. You know what I mean? But then what you want to take from it is who I am, my upbringing, why I'm this way, why I play with that competitive edge, you know, because that's the only way I know how to play. All right. Uh, so moving on, um, I you now coach one of the things you do post-career – uh, is you coach at Nazareth, Nazareth High School. Uh, I definitely wanted to come to some games this year, but, you know, life and things, I didn't get myself in the building. But you guys made it to the championship game. Uh, sadly, you guys lost, but I believe this is your first full year of coaching. Um, describe the, the, the challenges coaching young high school men, um, especially in a school like Nazareth, uh, where it is and, just what are the things that you try to teach them um, being their coach? And what was it like as your first year coaching just getting to the championship game? Um, now, I, we coached the year before. Okay. like Well, when it was the right before the pandemic. Okay. You know, but it was one of those things where you was just thrown in the fire. So, mm -hmm. you know, wasn't able to, you know, kind of, you know, get the guys that you wanted in the school. It was almost basically like starting from scratch. Okay. And I thought that that was dope. You know, because as much as you love basketball and um, you love the game, it's, you know, being able to teach it, you know what I mean? Like, uh, it's a big difference, 
you know, when you're teaching kids that don't know about the sport more than you're teaching kids that understand about it or who think they understand about it. But um, the difference is, you know, the best thing about it for me is I don't look at it from a standpoint of how everybody else look at the game of basketball. Mm-hmm. And when I say that, it's because if you have a coach like me that's played basketball on a lot of different levels and that was brought up a certain way, you have to understand that it's a different day and age, it's a different generation. And, you know, they're not going to be hard-nosed and nasty. You know what I mean? They don't, you know, don't really understand how to get it out the mud or, you know, to play you know, a certain way, you know, not to understand that you're not friends on a court and how hard you're supposed to go, you know. And once you, once I figured that out, it was kind of a lot easier for me, you know, to get across to them, you know. Um, but I also thought that the dope part about it is that I was able to practice with them some, mm-hmm. you know, you know, the year before, so they understand how hard I go. And they were able to go as hard as I've ever seen them play in my life because they're playing against me. So as much as, you know, I want to see that every day, you can't you can't really – I can't practice every day. Yeah. Because I still have to teach and mm-hmm. to stop and to do certain stuff. And the competitive nature in me is – Like, man, I'll put these sneakers on I'm right going to play, and now I'm expecting too much from you. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So – you know, it's like a tug of war. But I thought the dope part about that is that they were able to understand. I think that the documentary was beneficial to them. They know who their coach is, you know, for real. Because they know who I am. They know the trials and tribulations. And I think that it was easier for them to, you know, to um, to relax a little bit and to even to understand how hard you need to go because I know what it takes and I know what coaches are not looking for. You know, so I think that that's real beneficial, and it's helped me, you know, because of that, and 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 I'm thankful. So I'm gonna play a little rapid fire game. I'm gonna throw off some statements or names or whatever, and just give me the first few sentences that come to your mind when you hear those things. Uh, first, KB. Goat. <laughs> um, I can give you a few words. You know, I say goat because. He was able to go through some things that stopped me from going through them. You know, mm-hmm. I knew, like I told you earlier, I knew what I didn't want to do. I didn't want to go down that road to being a what if. Uh, fatherhood. The best thing that's happened to me because it gives you an even kill. You know, who knows who I would have been if I wasn't a father. You know, I had my daughter a few or less than two months after Nigel passed. Mm. So imagine if, you know, she wasn't coming into this world. Would I have made it through college? Would I have been Gary Irving with a long career? Mm-hmm. So, you know. Uh, speak of, I, do, I don't want to just touch over fatherhood like that, but, you know, being a girl dad, I know you have a son and a daughter. Uh, but some guys don't really look at having a girl as a, what's the word, uh, thing they want to do or want to happen to them in their lives. Uh, describe that level of responsibility being a girl father. It's a blessing, you know, um, because, you know, you have some, you have to have some sensitivity, mm-hmm. you know, you know, towards their needs. You know, you have to do a lot of uncomfortable things, you know, have those uncomfortable conversations. But, um She's definitely my my shiny moment, you know. She's definitely my princess. Um, um, And she's actually one of the reasons why I am who I am today because I know that, you know, it starts with her, you know. I do have another child, but she's my first. And everybody know how important, you know, your first child is. And let Mm -hmm. alone, it's a girl, you know. It's... It's it's something. Some people say it's karma, <laughs> <laughs> but you know I say it's a, you know it's a blessing. Okay, okay. Uh, next thing, um, Uncle Ross. Um, Don King. Oh, I like that. Um, I like um, that. He's that person. You know, he's that hype man. You know, he's that person that wants your best. 
you know, he's one of my biggest fans, you know, not just my uncle. Um, so, um, the mayor of Brooklyn. <laughs> uh, yeah. SOG. Uh, my heart, you know, who I am, you know, um, Band of Brothers, you know, um, something that's never, you know, forgotten. You know, it's easy for somebody that moves away at a certain age to, you know, kind of forget, you know, your upbringing and who was there from day one. You know, um, SOG is my home. That's my home. Copy. If I wanted to be remembered by anything, it would be being one of those guys that made it out of Gowanus. Gowanus. All right. Uh, so last two things. Um, when when people see this, when they see this, the uh, people that have known you all your life, people that have just started to know you like myself, what's the lasting impression you want them to know after they what is like what do they what should they know about G Earth that probably they didn't know? What's the secret? What do they what do you want them? What do you what is your imprint on on this after they watch it, after after people realize who you are that didn't know who you are, what's the imprint you want to leave on their life? Um don't judge a book by its cover. Um, that's one. Um, hard work and dedication beats talent when talent doesn't work hard because I wasn't, I didn't start off with the most talent. I was just the hardest worker and I was able to, you know, get better as time goes by. Um, I know a lot of people do know, but I don't want people to forget that I cherish my family my friends, you know, everybody else that was a part of my life that helped me, you know, to where I am today. Um, I don't think people give Larry Major credit. He get the utmost of credit, my coach that passed away from mm -hmm. Robeson, because he gave me opportunity, opportunity to showcase that. He let me be who I am, and at the end of the day, he was the one that really made me realize how talented I was and how um, I could use my God-gifted talents to get where I am. I want them to understand and remember that they look at my brother Jeff and just think that he's just my brother. Uh -huh. He's my sidekick. He's my twin. You know what I mean? Like, he give me life. He's one of those people that always give me those words. He always has my back when I'm down, when I'm struggling when I don't have the words, when I don't have the energy. You know what I mean? Like, so I don't want, I want people to understand that everybody had a part in helping me become who I am, you know. I always had the confidence, but confidence only gets you but so far. You need that supporting cast. And I think my supporting cast made me who I am. It wasn't just G. Irv, you know, the yeah. person, the basketball player, you know, and uh the the person that's calm and cool off court but that's gritty and a beast on court you know so i want people to understand that too okay uh so last thing i you said something i don't know if i really heard it correctly is g irv done in unlimited is he done playing basketball in the street basketball scene is that is that something has, that has contemplated that has been in his mind if it's still a decision you're making that's fine but i just need to know is this the last was was what was this past summer the last time I seen you on a basketball court repping a jersey? Um You always say that you're done or you're not done. Um I was always told that don't stop doing something that you love until God stop you from doing it. Mm. So um, we all <clears throat> watched the playoffs. We watched the NFL. <laughs> we watched Tom Brady say he retired. And then come back two months and later. And come back once he realized that his wife was annoying at home. <laughs> <laughs> the kids but, was a little bit too loud. <laughs> you know what I mean? But... Mm. 
I'll be back. I'll be back. Is that confirmed? Is this a, is this a decision you feel like you've you've thought, a, thought long and hard enough about, or is this? I mean, I mean, I didn't go out the way I was supposed to. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, everybody say that if you was gonna go out how you went out last game is cool, and you know everybody wants you to be remembered. You know, on a high. Mm -hmm. Who knows what my high is? You know what I mean? Like, if I'm still able to go, you know, my foot is fine. I'm going to go ahead and go because if it's one thing I don't lack, it's confidence. confidence. Yeah. That's who I am. And when you're smart enough to know the game and the ins and outs, mm -hmm. you can play for a long time. Play a so, different way. Tom Brady is back. <laughs> <laughs> and just like that, we'll end it that way. G Irv back here. Sway Report and Live one on one sit downs. Just want to thank you again for being here. Definitely a great interview. Learned a lot. And definitely I will never forget this. Guys, another great interview. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Stay tuned for the next one. Sway Report and Live one on one interviews. G Irv, peace. Out. I mean, you said it best that I'm probably, you know, kind of chill and laid back if people don't know me. But on that basketball court, I'm a, I'm a killer. Step through, fade away, jump on T.O.